Good evening. Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome to the Museum of Modern Art uh, for one of the first conversations uh, of 2017. My name is Sean Anderson, and I am Associate Curator of Architecture in the Department of Architecture and Design. Tonight, it is a great pleasure to introduce our guest, Ben Rollins, author of the 2016 book, City of Thorns, Nine Lives in the World's Largest Refugee Camp, originally published by Portobello Books and Macmillan Picador. This evening is the latest conversation in an initiative born from exhibitions that include One Way Ticket, Jacob Lawrence Migration Series, organized by Leah Dickerman in 2015, and from 2016, Busha Khalili's Mapping Journey Project, organized by Stuart Comer. In addition, the soon to conclude Insecurities, Tracing Displacement and Shelter, which I organized along with Ariel Dion Kosnik, in part forms the basis of a museum initiative we call Citizens and Borders. Seeking to identify as well as visualize the multiple registers that now complicate what makes a citizen today. We encourage cross-disciplinary pro approaches to understanding how boundaries and their sometimes embodiment affect artistic, architectural, and design production. Insecurities from the start attempts to ask questions rather than propose solutions for only that which could be called one of the most challenging and unprecedented movements of people a set of crises for our time. I will not begin this evening with an incomprehensible figures, such as more than 65 million displaced individuals today, or the recounting of recent horrors in the Mediterranean, more than 1,000 men, women, and children uh, perishing in the past two to three weeks, either crossing the sea or freezing to death, or yesterday's tragedy on the Nigeria-Cameroon border. Instead, I will begin with individuals, the individuals that populate Ben's moving book, and the images of a city that is both in the making or being unmade, those of photographer Brendan Bannon, whose work is in the exhibition, uh, and these images that are scrolling behind me tonight, uh, those from Dadab, which marked 25 years since its inception in 2016, a literal generation of displacement. On the heels of the French Revolution and at the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution in 1819, the writer, playwright, and statesman uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe writes, the country which does not protect the stranger soon goes under. This recognition of the intersection and often the disappearance of the stranger into the unseen geographies from war-torn countries and into those like our own and many others that house or detain millions demands how, and more importantly, who do we see when we see the other. During a moment in which we perhaps all might feel like strangers in our own country, the use of the word our here indicates a possessive form, suggesting that we share equally in the making of our spaces. But recent history and our very uncertain future illustrates this may not be the case. Here, however, in the museum, the presence of the refugee remains key to its history as an institution as well as its mission. In the 1940s, Margaret Scolari Barr and her husband, Alfred Barr Jr., the museum's founding director, were keen supporters of the Emergency Rescue Committee, which later became the International Rescue Committee, and eventually assisted nearly 2,000 artists, scholars, musicians, and those working in the arts to escape Vichy France, to find safety within and on these walls and in the U.S., by 1964, curator Bernard Rudofsky assembled a collection of images for an exhibition entitled Architecture Without Architects, an introduction to non-pedigreed architecture that 
that sought to question difference within and through the built, or in some cases, unbuilt vernaculars. This was an unconventional, transnational approach to thinking about architecture before the word global was a loose-fitting catch-all term denoting everywhere but here. 53 years on, it remains unclear whether the designed objects and spaces of architect by architects and designers for ongoing and near persistent refugee emergencies and for natural disasters have indeed an ensured efficacy for which there is broad agreement. Disasters continue to loom at many different scales and forms. At the local, however, described so eloquently in Ben's book, in a refugee camp called Dadab, whose current population is nearing 500,000, that which divides also informs. The systems that so often are used to protect us are the same that fragment, sometimes violently. In my discussions with refugees and internally displaced persons and asylum seekers in a number of contexts throughout the world, all said that their ability to contribute to the making of home, to invest shelter with self, was more consequential than that of the imposition of an architecture, whether permanent or not, by the state. Yet this reaction remains problematic when observing Dadab in northern Kenya. At the outset, safety necessitates structure. But when the same frameworks detain rather than expand livelihoods, when time no longer connotes stability, what other forms can be used to simultaneously resist the elements and manifest security? Ben's book asks at once, how do we visualize and occupy loss of home, of nation, of a history burdened by destruction? What happens when we leave one home and live at the margins, at the in-between, in an indefinite limbo? He has suggested to me that his book is at once a record of fashioning life in the midst of movement. Likewise, to acknowledge the outgoing president in a recent interview by Michiko Kakutani in the New York Times, he says, at a time when so much of our politics is trying to manage this clash of cultures brought about by globalization and technology and migration, the role of stories to unify as opposed to divide, to engage rather than to marginalize, is more important than ever. End quote. Tonight, then, it is my ambition to uncover through Ben's personal observations and insights whether it is possible, and I believe that it is, to find dignity in as much to locate identity and autonomy in an urbanism that is constructed and imagined as temporary and yet unfolds through resiliency. Yet this urbanism that we find in Dadaab, as well as many, many other refugee camps in the world, continues to proliferate at the edges of multiple nations and cities alike. Individuals often become invisible here, yet Ben's book allows them to be seen and heard again. How might we consider architecture's role in contributing to, reinforcing, and hopefully diminishing this atlas of misery. Our conversation then, like the exhibition, indeed perhaps the museum as a whole, will hopefully add to this collection of narratives that for better or worse, ultimately holds up a mirror to the present while seeking to provide some form of permanence in transit. So. I have asked Ben uh, to do a short reading tonight of some passages from his book, for those of you who are not familiar with it, and then we will uh, have our conversation. And then after our conversation, more or less, we'll open up the floor for questions. All right, thank you. Ben, please. Good evening. Nice to see you all on a, a cold night. Um, images are problematic. Of course, a writer is going to say that. 
Um, what drew me to Dadaab in the first place, the, this city of thorns, was that I thought I knew what a refugee camp was, was like. I'd been to several, I used to work for Human Rights Watch. My job was covering human rights abuses across the Horn of Africa. But when I arrived in Dadaab, it blew my mind. I thought, how on earth can a, a city like this, really because that's what it was when I first encountered it, exist in the middle of this baking desert? And how can it have been there for 20 years at that time when I first went? Now it's been there for 25. I rapidly quit my job, devoted myself to this project because... Um, let's get a bit closer. Um, because I... I was struggling with this, this contradiction between these images of long lines of tents laid out in a grid, which is what we habitually associate with a refugee camp. In fact, stock photographs of Dadaab on uh, most media sites that you will have encountered are usually used to illustrate the concept of a refugee camp. But that actually tells us nothing about what it's like to live there. So the book is an attempt to take you right down into this place, into the grubby streets, and into the lives and the hearts of some of these people who live there. Um, so having said that, I'm going to take you sort of down into those grubby streets, but starting with the aerial view um, from a satellite. There's Kenya, there's Dadaab, close to the border with Somalia. And then right down close, you see Dadaab town, and then you see these four refugee camps, Cambios, Hagadera, Ifo, Ifo, Tu, Dagahale, around, arranged around Dadaab. So I'm just going to read you a brief section about that initial vision. The town of Dadaab clings to the flat red plain, a hair's breadth above the equator. Thorn trees stretch in a stubborn thicket for hundreds of miles in every direction. Here, the main road from Nairobi to Mogadishu makes a short dogleg through what was once a sleepy Kenyan border settlement, established in 1954 as a borehole by the British. In the local dialect, the name Dadab means the rocky hard place. Because two inches below the red sand are sheets of diamond hard stone, those first inhabitants had no idea how appropriate the name would become. Most foreign visitors arrive here by plane, and it's from the air that the scale of the refugee complex is best appreciated. Spread out over 30 square miles, the camps look like huge black and silver moons shot through with a web of red veins orbiting Dadaab town. The red is the grid of unpaved roads, the silver is the glint of tin roofs in the punishing sun, and the black is the ubiquitous building material of the desert, the acacia thorn but it is a perspective that few refugees ever get to see. For the inhabitants, the size of the camps is not so easily grasped. From the southern camp, Hagadera, to the northern one, Dagahale, is, for someone with no bus fare, a walk of several days. There are no fences around the makeshift city. There's simply nowhere to go. On four sides, for hundreds of miles in each direction, the desert burns. North and east, is war, south and west is Kenya, forbidden. The road south is chocked with roadblock, choked with roadblocks manned by greedy police, and within and between the camps is the only freedom of movement. So this is the aerial view of one particular camp. Ifo is one of the older ones where that original grid has kind of uh, been morphed or been evolved, let's say through uh, the, the, the people proliferating out of their, the squares that they've been allotted. And this is a new one. Ifo 2 was a new camp that was opened while I was doing my research. And let me just read you one brief paragraph about that. The geography of a refugee camp is about two things, visibility and control. The same principles that guide a prison the refugee camp has the structure of punishment without the crime. The crime is implied. And by and large, the refugees, docile, disempowered, do as they are told. They hesitate before authority 
and they plead for their rights in the language of mercy. This is one of the other older camps, but still retaining that structure. And this is one of the characters, and this is what I really like talking about. Because it's through these people um, that I hope to show you in the book. I can't tell you all the stories of everybody in the book now, um, but it's through their lives, really, that you see what the camp's like, what it's like to live in this place. Monday is a, a young man from Sudan. He was a lost boy. He was friends with Valentino Atchak Deng, who is the star of Dave Egger's book, What is the What? Um, but, of course, those refugees who are resettled here are such a few small minority. The majority are still stuck in these refugee camps throughout the region. Monday is one of them, and he's a kind of Romeo in my book because he falls in love with a young Somali girl called Muna, and her family, of course, don't like the match. She has been raised in the camp, born and raised in the camp, and has imbibed <clears throat> the language of the UN, human rights. She knew that she didn't want to be circumcised. She knew that when her parents said, we've got this lovely old man prepared for you to marry, that she didn't have to accept. She had the, the confidence of the generation raised by the UN. She said, no, I quite fancy this Sudanese plumber called Monday. And what ensued was a manhunt because her family went after him with machetes and bows and arrows and a whole long drama which evolves over several chapters that I can't tell you now, but I'd love to. So that it gives you a sense of some of the intercommunal strife that's going on in the camp. Another young woman, Cairo, she's a teacher now, but she also was born in the camp and spent her whole life desperately studying very, very hard to win one of a few scholarships to Canadian University. Canada is the only country that offers that offers scholarships for refugees from Dadaab, and it's intensely competitive. Um, and her drama, all of the things she went to to try and study, including her mother working for 10 years collecting wood in the desert in order to buy batteries to allow her to do homework, because Dadaab is on the equator, so at 6 p.m. it gets dark. If you want to do homework, you want to study and do well, you need a torch. Um, all of those trials and tribulations are what make up her story. And these two guys, Mahat and Nisho, um, both born in, uh, Mahat came more recently, Nisho born in the camp. They, get to the, where's, they work here in the market. And Nisho started out as a porter, carrying sacks of rice and sacks of potatoes, um, and ended up um, as, an, as a loader working on the trucks, unloading all the rice and all the sugar and all the smuggled goods that were coming over from Somalia. And through him, you get a sense of the whole network of organized crime and smuggling that centers on the camp. Um, just to tell you what these other pictures are, that's Nisho again. That's just a, a regular house. This is the food distribution that the whole camp is, is fueled by food aid. And that is distributed through these huge hangars and which turn over every two weeks and everybody gets a small basket of food currently reduced by 50% because the UN has a budget crisis. But that is one of, the, one of the people in the book getting their rations which are distributed every two weeks. This is a cinema, the Man United cinema where they watch the Premier League soccer games. This is Nisho, that's where he likes to go at the weekend. That's his house that he just built. And this is a man called Dube, who runs a restaurant. And his story is, is very interesting. I'll, I won't go into, into too much detail, but his sons were resettled to California. When he heard that they were cleaning toilets for a living, he went to access his savings, which were buried in the sand in his restaurant because there's no banks. And he went to the... Western Union money wiring service in the camp and he wired $75,000 to San Francisco which he had buried in the sand because he'd made a lot of money running his restaurant renting out vehicles to the NGOs because he didn't want his sons to clean toilets he thought that was an undignified job and he wanted them to buy a 12 reeler truck to start a trucking business so there are rich as well as poor and through all these stories, you get this image of a, of a, of a very rich uh, economy and society that is existing in this camp. 
That's the market that we've spoken about. That's Cairo again. And this is a, a celebration in the camp. That's Nisho's mother-in-law's house. And that's just a, a panorama of the camp. Um, the book doesn't have any of these images, so it's, it's very rare that I, I get to show them. Um, and the reason the book doesn't have these images is really because I wanted to focus on the stories. Nonetheless, they do set the scene, they give you a sense of, uh, of, the, of this place. Um, but hopefully, if you haven't had the chance, do read the book and, and go there um, in a very real sense, not just seeing it from afar, but actually inhabiting the lives of those people. Um, I'll go and sit down, and Sean's going to join me. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. I feel very humbled because I think I'd rather just listen to you talk. Uh, no, none of them came from me, so uh, we'd rather hear your stories. So um, maybe you could share a few when, in the midst of our conversation, right? So uh, I've been thinking a lot about where to begin our conversation. Uh, I unfortunately have yet to go to Dadaab, even though I've, I've tried on a number of occasions to get permission to go, because one needs permission to enter a refugee camp for various reasons. Uh, but the camps that I have visited, whether they've been large or, or small, all contain stories. They, they seem very much to, on one hand, escape the image that we recognize and see, and when, when I've been in, in, for instance, in Zatari, in Jordan, one of the largest uh, camps in the world as well, what struck me first was the ground. And so when this image appeared, uh, and when we were looking at it earlier, I started to think about what this ground signifies. And I was wondering if you could share with us some of your very first impressions could be Dadaab, it could be another location. For me, in Zatari, and, uh, in, and looking and poring over images um, in preparation for the exhibition, I kept coming back to this ground and what the ground signified. So, Well, the interesting thing about Dadaab is that this red earth, for as long as anybody can remember, was actually Somali grazing territory. This was where a lot of the people in Dadaab who now are called or determined as refugees were in fact Somali nomads grazing their, their flocks of camels and goats. But the British um, did a deal with the Kenyans upon independence and gave this part of the desert to, Somali to, to Kenya rather than Somalia, even though the inhabitants wanted it to be part of Somalia. So I've learned a lot about what that sand means over the last five years. When I first got there, I was, it was just a continuation of the desert of northern Kenya, and there is no distinguishing mark, and pretty much until you get to Kismayu and then onwards to Mogadishu in Somalia, the, the, the territory um, doesn't really speak to you in the language of maps. It speaks to you in, in the language of these thorns and the occasional dip, and. The, the sort of ground that the nomads can read like a map, but which to a, somebody untrained like me just appears to be a kind of wilderness. And you think, how on earth can you survive where it's 45 degrees centigrade? I don't know what that is in American, but 100, <laughs> 100 plus, it's yeah. baking hot. And when you're going there as a researcher, interviewing people all day, we would park ourselves under a tree to escape this, you know, this beating of the sun like a hammer on your head. And you wonder how people live there day in, day out. They're working in the market, in the black market. They're going out into the desert, gathering firewood, looking after their goats and so on. So it's just incredibly hostile. I mean, and the sand is blowing and whipping around your face and you can't see. You need a, you know, a, a jalabia, you need a hat, you need sunglasses. It's very hostile. Um, and yet, as I came to speak to people, um, Tawane's father, one of the, the characters in the book, had 
actually come from very near Dadaab. His family had come from Dadaab. They'd moved to Somalia, then they ran away from Somalia with the war. They were back to very, very nearly their ancestral land. But here he was with a begging cap in hand, and he was very traumatized by this. And he was a proud man, and he said it really hurts him. Every night he lays his head on this sand, and he has to consider that this was once his home, but now it's belonged to somebody else, and he's denied that sort of natural connection with that he would that he would like and that he assumes, but it's it's been transformed by these lines that somebody else drew. And uh, these lines that you're you're speaking of, when when writ large, we can imagine them as being borders. And so a year ago, almost, uh, you were quite fortunate to have a conversation in Brooklyn with the the singer. Uh, Kinan, who's also Somali, and a lot of what I remember from that conversation revolved around the border. A and to me, and, and in the exhibition, we can't begin a conversation about displacement without thinking of borders. And so borders as both imagined as well as constructed. And so I, I wanted to continue that in, in a bit, uh, and to imagine then once the ground is marked, once the ground is gridded and rationalized and ordered, and like you said, I, I, I completely agree about the idea of the, the grid of the camp being f about control uh, and about visibility. Are there new borders that develop? And, and, and I would assume that there are, not only beyond um, uh, class or, or tribe or, or location, but could you talk a little bit about what those new borders that develop in the, in the city of Dadaab? Yes, I mean there are, we could, talk, we could talk all night about this, yeah. but <laughs> you, you, have, you have the grid itself, so when you arrive in the refugee camp, when Tawane's family, for example, arrived in 1992, they planted a fence around the square you saw that one of the pictures of, of, of Brendan with this, these grids marked out on the, on the sand. Now, when a family is assigned a plot of land like that, they plant a fence. Because, of course, just like everybody, you want a bit of privacy, you want your own garden, you want your own land. Now, that fence is what's called a live fence. These thorn bushes are the only thing that grow there. They're the only building material. So everybody plants a fence which grows. And now, you look, when you look down the alleyways of these blocks, A1, A2, A3, they go on for a mile and a half in, in each camp. It's a wall of, of thorns, which is 20 feet high. So the whole camp to a newcomer is completely bewildering. You just, you're going, it's like some kind of maze, you know, to find your, to find a way, your way around. Um, so there are those borders. Then there are all of the sort of social borders that are imported from Somalia or from Sudan, from the countries where people have, have fled, because people generally congregate with their own tribe, with their own nationality. So you have the Sudanese block where Monday lives with his lost boys, and they have spears to protect Monday and Muna from her family coming to try and kill him and kill their baby, um, because they think that the baby's a mutant. Um, so you have a, and they've put up an extra fence around their section. Um, and then you have all of these roadblocks all the way down the road into Kenya. And the biggest one is at the River Tana, which is the sort of ancient hist border, historical border between Somalia and Kenya, um, which the refugees refer to as Halak, which means cobra, because that's where the Kenyan police snap all your money uh, if you're going down to, down to Kenya. Um, Plus, you have these sort of imagined horizons. Nisho, who we saw there, who works in the market, spent his whole life in Dadaab. He's never left. I was fortunate to talk to him about, uh, uh, to, be, to meet him just before his first voyage back to Somalia for the first time ever. And for him, this was like, you know, this was like me as a, as a young 20-year-old going to Africa for the first time, absolutely terrified. Um, going into Somalia, all he's heard about Somalia is war. And all these people coming who are traumatized and hungry. And so for him, the edge of the, of the camp, look, or he was looking at that horizon every day for 24 years. 
Um, and, and this first trip voyage out beyond the camp was this incredible leap of imagination that he um, was very hard for him, very courageous for him to do because so many kids um, don't have that courage. They've been sort of institutionalized in the camp for so long. Um, so there's, there are borders all over the place, you know. I, it's, it's, uh, I became really interested in the fact that borders are both built, literally, so they it, describe or inscribe a sense of ownership and they are imagined as well, right? And so much uh, of the beginning part of the book, but also I would argue throughout the book, is this movement across borders. So you have the macro scale of, of populations moving from Somalia through the desert to Dedab. Then you have the movement of your characters and others including NGO and, and aid workers through the borders uh, of the camp. And what I, I came to the conclusion was that in, it must be a human phenomenon, that we create borders, that we make borders in order to invest ourselves and our spaces with a degree of security. And yet, when, when I've read about Dadaab, it also has this level of danger. And of course, it's in your book as well. And so one of the questions I have that on one hand, if you can make a fence and you can make a, a house, how does trauma persist? How does the memory of where they came from, where these, these individuals and groups and, and collectives in a way come, do they remember where they came from? Do they talk about it? And how do they remember it? Let me tell you the story of Tawani again, because he's very illustrative. He arrived on a, age seven on a donkey cart in 92 with his dad. And his dad, who, who had grown up on that, in that very same area. And when they arrived and they were given this square of sand, his father refused to inhabit the UN tent. Um, the, the UN tent for, was not, you know, that wasn't his, that wasn't his traditional home, no way. And then later, when they, the NGOs came and encouraged people to build shelters with tin roofs, with these corrugated iron roofs, he said no. They built an agal, which is a Somali nomadic tent, basically these bent sticks with, and then you put um, hide or, or blankets, or in these days, UN plastic, over it. And it's a, a, a portable tent that you move around the desert with. And he said, no, we're having an agal because we are, we're only here temporarily. We're not going to be here for very long. 24 years later, <laughs> he's buried in the dam. He died in the last year of the research that I was doing for the book. And he, was, he communicated to his children this fear of Somalia. So on the one hand, we're not here long. We're going back to Somalia. But every time the, his children talked about return, he would be full of the stories of what had happened and what caused them to flee. He was beaten up. He was, his two eldest sons were murdered in front of him. And he couldn't get over that story. And so his children, just like Nisho, who's heard all these stories of Somalia, his children too um, are, in fact, inheriting the trauma even though they didn't experience it themselves. So when you talk to Tawane about going back, he said, oh, no, no, no. You know, I know what happens in Somalia. Because he's heard these stories from his dad. Um, and interestingly enough, the, there's something, there must be some epigenetic research in there somewhere. Because his father has this story about a guy called Rambo, who was a warlord, who abused him when, during the war in Somalia, um, dragged his father by the hands along the blacktop of the road and stripped his father's skin from his head to his knees. And he was traumatized by this, as you can imagine, and he, the children watched and they knew the story. And then when they moved to Hagadera, because the refugee camp is a haven for everybody, and this is part of the problem that the UN faces, they realized that the block leader of their block was Rambo. Because of course Rambo had come from in the refugee flood with everybody else and he had arrived in the camp and as a sort of leading elder of the clan he had been appointed the block leader so he's the one that they then had to negotiate with for all of their needs in the camp um, 
and the, the, the sons wanted to go to Rambo and kill him. And Tawani's father said, no, 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 it, that's past now. You know, I have forgiven him, you must forgive him too. But the anger of the sons was stronger than the anger of the father, the wronged father himself. So, the, yeah, the trauma is everywhere. It's everywhere. Yeah. It, 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 that story is it's almost an, a mirror of uh, a story that I was told in, in Zatari. In fact, almost exactly the same in, in the sense that uh, I had met a Bedouin uh, gentleman and he was the only tent, a fabric tent, that I could find in this sea of metal boxes. And when I was in Zatari, it was 125 degrees Fahrenheit, more or less. And this tent was beautiful. And it was made of coffee sacks that he had scrounged together and sewn together. And I asked him, I said, well, you know, why do you live in this tent? And he said, I refuse to live in a metal box. And he was right, because the temperature alone from an architecture standpoint, uh, was it was perfect. It was very comfortable. We were on the ground. It, it was lovely. And so uh, these stories uh, of the architecture and the space and the interiors that you begin to occupy in your book are quite telling and, and quite powerful. So I want to switch gears a bit and talk a little bit about architecture for a moment. And there is a great paragraph about midway through the book when you were talking about the design of Ifo2. And you were talking about interlocking stabilized soil blocks. But I was wondering if you could illuminate also what the material nature of the camp is. Well, the city of thorns is actually a very apt description because pretty much everything is made of thorns. Um, and, it, and left to their own devices, that's what, that's sort of the only material the Somalis would use. But they then, of course, in the bricolage of the camp, they use the, the, the tin, the plastic, the other stuff that they can get their hands on. Um, the, the story of the ISSBs is a, is a well-known scandal in, in Dadaab, the interlo interlocking stabilized soil blocks, because the Kenyan government does not allow concrete. No permanent infrastructure. This is a temporary camp. So there's no permanent drainage, there's no permanent roads, there's no permanent buildings, no concrete, no bricks. The UN negotiated, and the deal they did was you can make bricks out of soil, but not out of clay, because soil is less permanent. So the UN built a 100 of these show homes um, made with tin roofs and these ISSB mud bricks, basically. Um, and the Kenyan government came along to have a look, and they said, mm, they look a bit too much like houses. Um, refugees are supposed to live in shelters, transitional shelters, nothing that looks too permanent like a house. These look like nice houses that Kenyans would like to live in, and that's not going to look good. So the Kenyan government, because it would embarrass them, forbade the UN from going ahead with these blocks. So they had to demolish the 100 houses that they'd built, um, and they were back to square one, putting everybody in tents. But these tents last two years, maximum. and maximum. They, they get shredded in the heat and the rain, and then people build their own huts. And so in a, in a, it's a funny in the sense that the, the building materials supplied by the UN do end up getting used, but not in the way that they're intended. And that principle, I think, holds for pretty much everything that the UN or the NGOs try to do in the camp, that the intended consequence is always entirely different. You try and do this and you end up doing this um, because the people will adapt. Um, and actually you, you cannot predict the funny ways in which the, 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 the sort of social movement of that act is, is diverted or subverted. And, and you were telling me earlier about uh, the Congo camp, no? Uh, about the use of, yes. of, of concrete. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, Is well, it the Congo camp? Sorry. Yes, it's the Congolese block. Congolese block. In one in Ifo camp. It's, it's odd in a, in a city made of concrete where it's, it's so ubiquitous, but to imagine that concrete in Dadaab is a really rare, scarce, and desirable thing. And the pouring of it is an act of, of, uh, of subversion. Like concrete is really subversive in Dadaab because it's such a temporary place. 
So the Congolese bloc, they, so all arrogant, decided to pour concrete in defiance of the orders of the Kenyan government and the UN, and they have a little concrete wall around their section, and they've got several compounds with a concrete floor, which is great because it's a you know it's much more easy to manage you can drain the concrete away from your you can you know angle it so you have a you know, drainage and so on all the things that the kenya government doesn't want you to have but they're very proud of their concrete it's a, a kind of absurd inverse of of what you'd expect and in 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 light of that then would you say that the the systems that are in place for better or for worse uh, I would argue m a refugee camp of this scale and of course of, of its, its length of time that it's been in existence demands that we start to look at these and observe and question these uh, spaces as cities. Would you, would you agree? Absolutely. Yeah, the language of cities and, the, and the, the methodology of cities is entirely appropriate. And yet there are so many institutional barriers to doing that. So Zatari camp for existence, for example, partnered with the city of Amsterdam, the urban planning department, and discussed with them their infrastructure, their drainage, their transport networks, their telecommunications, and they used that advice. But even then, Killian Kleinschmidt, who was for a while became famous as the mayor of Zatari, resigned because he said, the UN is just too inflexible that it cannot cope with, with the, the kind of flexibility and autonomy that these people would like. And the irony is, if you allowed the refugees to build and plan their own city, of course they would do it far better than any you know, cookie cutter plan coming from the UN. But the encampment model, as it's known in the humanitarian world, is very well entrenched, and it has been for 20 years. This is how the U international community and national governments like to approach large-scale humanitarian problems because it's easier. It's much easier to identify refugees, to access them, to organize them and control them than to go looking for them in the suburbs of Beirut, for example. And, and by, by extension, the grid then becomes the mechanism by which this, what I say is a proto-city, uh, emerges as a, a form of control, of visibility, and, and efficiency. Uh, as it were. I, I remember the military commander that runs Zatari saying to me he refused to have any sense of, of community planning because he said, this is not a community. And yet, we all know uh, that in communities develop naturally, organically. Uh, you, you can't stop it. You I can't mean, stop it. Right? That's the, you know, there's this fallacy that you can enforce temporariness at the barrel of a gun or you know, through the rule of law or something, but you can't. And or these communities are evolving and moving all the time. And instead of, it would be so much more productive to harness that uh, rather than trying to force people into living into, in certain ways. The, the, the best example of that in Dadaab, which you don't have in Zatari, is the, the ban on work that actually in Dadaab, the Kenyans, the Somalis cannot work. Refugees have this whole economy going on, this whole black market, um, which exists outside the Kenyan taxation system. The absurdity of that is that you have tax collectors from Garissa, the nearest town, showing up and pretty much shaking down the refugees for tax anyway. And you also have the, the city council coming along and issuing title deeds, handwritten title deeds with the stamp of the city of Garissa, which is 100 kilometers away, trying to enforce this kind of order because they want a, bit of, a piece of the action. Um, and yet, you know, f for 20 years, these title deeds have been traded, bought and sold into DAB. They're meaningless. But it has established its own kind of momentum, which if only you could harness would be, you know, a, uh, a, fear, a fearsome amount of energy. It, it's something I, I also felt quite palpably in the in the book was this economy, uh, internal and external. So on one hand, you have humanitarianism business, which is a huge multi-billion-dollar, multi-country business, which is a model and, and a term that is rarely used when we want to describe uh, the UN and and the actions of NGOs. And then you have an internal business, whether it's black or, or, or invisible or not. And 
they seemingly coexist, but they don't, uh, because they keep butting up against each other uh, in various forms. And so one of the, the quotes I found uh, as well, and I, I want to recast it for you, you were, you were talking about famine uh, at length, obviously. And I think from the American public standard, we have read, we have heard famine for a long time, uh, at, for, for better and for worse. And, and there are many actions for and against uh, famine. So if we use famine as a backdrop, that famine is a catalyst for donors, as you describe, giving money. You write, the famine was an obligation, an inconvenience, and a business opportunity. And I would like to rewrite that and say, the camp is an obligation, an inconvenience, and a business opportunity. And so I was wondering if you might be able to reflect on, on that kind of recasting of economy, but also on the fact that, from my perspective as well, that the design of camps, whether it's at the small scale or at the large scale, demands a kind of reconceptualization from the point of uh, from the point of economy, but also of geopolitics. Yeah, it's the politics. Is the politics is the sort of uh, the force field that holds all of this in place. And the, the the interesting way to illustrate that perhaps is that the camp doesn't have a fence around it. So people can, can walk in and out. You know, we can go there and walk in and out. But there are all these forces that keep everybody stuck there. There's the war in Somalia, so they can't go back. There's the fact that Kenya doesn't want them in Kenya, won't give them jobs and work permits. And the West won't relocate people either. So you have um, this movement of people now beginning from Dadaab to walk to Europe because they rightly say, well, there's no future in the camp, the war's not stopping, Kenya doesn't want me. So the end of the book is the, the young boy who begins it, Guled, actually telling me his plans to walk to Europe via Sudan, Darfur, Chad, Libya, all the way up to the Mediterranean. Um, and the, that is the, the, the only, ultimately, the only sort of human way out um, because the bureaucracy doesn't work. The politics are, are keeping everybody there. Um, the, the UN resettlement system is broken. We're not, the rich countries are not accepting their quotas that the UN is asking them to take. So people can't come there. The host com countries like Jordan and Kenya are tired and bored. The wars of our 21st century are not ending. They're just sort of sliding into this kind of militarized capitalism where the West says, okay, peace, elections, bye-bye. And you have Iraq, you have Afghanistan, you have Somalia, you know, still in that, in that sort of limbo where supposedly they're at peace. There's been a transitional government in Somalia for 10 years. Um, nothing changes. So, yes, the, the camp in that circumstance, under those geopolitical conditions, is the obvious choice because the host governments don't want to integrate these populations they want to keep them separate if you're going to ask the international community to look after them and to pay for them then they would much rather a grid through which they can drive and organize and uh, and, and control and access people than some random suburb and they certainly don't want to let the refugees run things um, because that would make things far too complicated. And the refugees, above all, want to put down roots, want to invest, want to build uh, you know, viable cities. So it's the politics that's got to somehow be unlocked in order then to facilitate, I think, the kind of creative architectural responses that, that, that could happen. And creative being the, the operative word there. In a way, it moves from social obligation to social responsibility, because the word responsibility gets bandied about in architectural discourse quite a bit and in design discourse as well, but we don't know what that looks like uh, necessarily. Uh, I know that uh, we would like to have a broader discussion with the audience now, uh, and so I was going to open up um, the floor 
to questions, and we have microphones uh, in the audience as well. So if you would like to raise your hand, uh, we can get the conversation rolling. Hello. Uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, this is incredible work, so congratulations on this. Um, the, refugee f the refugee camps, they sort of feel, I mean, they are this permanent temporariness. Um, so it all feels kind of like a waiting game. Uh, what exactly is the UN waiting for? Like, what, is, what are they working towards, if anything, that keeps these refugee camps on lock? Do you want to take more than, more than one or just one at a time? Uh, well, we could take more than one, I guess. Yeah. yeah, why don't we take two at a time? Because yeah. there are lots. And I've got a question or two for you about the oh, exhibition right. as well. <laughs> Thank you, and amazing work for, um, I haven't read the book, but both the, the referring to the book and the exhibition. Um, the question of the, um, about the, um, you started talking that images are problematic, and somehow we also realize that borders are imagined and contracted, and, and somehow we can imagine some of them, we can see them and notice them in architecture and design, some of them are exist in a more literary form. And I, and I wonder whether that's a weakness uh, that we have to describe imagined uh, or politically constructed borders. In that sense, the question is a bit rhetorical, but it's um, with, how do you think that those political borders or geopolitical borders that we're describing about the West deciding this or Somalia deciding that, how can that be represented? Is, it, is the word or the text the only way? Or are there other means? Because if the text is the response, then I would assume there is a weak chance that that, that representation can be widely spread. That's a good point. Um, let me uh, deal with the first question about what the UN is working towards. Um, the UN is not really in control this is also another sort of fallacy that that ultimately it's the nation state that is hosting those people and they've asked the UN to look after them because they don't want to um, and that's pretty much the case in most of the of the countries that are hosting uh, refugees um, so from from Greece to Yemen to uh, Thailand you know that's that's the model um, so the UN is in a very difficult position. They get a lot of bad publicity because they're the ones who have their names on all the tents. They're the ones who are there who are supposed to be managing this crisis. But they are very much prisoners of this institutional system. Um, and it's the nation states, of course, that fund the UN. So even if they are working towards something, often that something is, is very much frustrated and contingent upon the politics of the, of the nation states. Having said that, they also have a stunning lack of vision about what is possible. Um, and often will just accept the geopolitical reality and say, oh, well, that's politics. There's nothing we can do about that. So mostly, they are, it is a waiting game and they're waiting. They're waiting for the next posting to be moved somewhere else so that they can deal, somebody else can deal with that problem. Um, and Dadaab is really the best example of that because it's just, you know, generation after generation. An interesting w fact that the budget for Dadaab is still an emergency funding budget that's agreed every six months. When a town the size of New Orleans needs a municipal budget that's regular with good planning so that you can fund your schools and your hospitals and your, uh, you know, your infrastructure ahead of time so you can hire teachers and all this stuff. And instead, they're, they're scrabbling around every six months and they're raiding the health budget because that's the biggest chunk of money. So the health budget, you keep drawing a red line and then you draw the red line a bit lower and then you draw the red line a bit lower until actually you're picking off diseases that you won't treat. So, for example, you can't get dialysis in a UN hospital. So if you've got a kidney problem, sorry. Um, so that's how it's going um, because of this temporary, this, this sort of inability to accept the permanence and to deal with it. 
Um, and the UN often is, is very reluctant to push the politics. They'll just sort of sit there quietly trying to look after as many people as possible. It's, they're in a tough, tough corner. I wouldn't like to work for them. The, um, the, the point about other ways of representing this is particularly relevant when you're talking about Somali culture, for example, which is incredibly oral, where everything is sung and everything is poetry. So the, the history of Somalia is all sung in these epic poems about the wonderful deeds of the mad mullah of Somaliland and these other characters. So to be really transformative in Somali culture, in Somali politics, you need to have a song, not a book or an exhibition full of images. You need to have a song. And those are the things that, that's where the battles are fought in the recent elections in Mogadishu were all through poetry. Um, so the, lo the domestic politics, the same, I would say, in, in, in many other African regions, uh, African countries in that region, um, is that it's, uh, the, the po local political idioms are very different from the ways in which you know, outsiders come, come in and, and represent it. Do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I wanted I mean, to. We were ask talking you about <laughs> images and and representation. I think. Yeah. Well, yes. I mean, when I went to my first chance to see the exhibition was this afternoon, and the first thing you see as you walk in is this long line of names of uh, the United Organization in ne in the Netherlands that has documented the death of every single refugee and asylum seeker mm -hmm. in Europe or on the edge of Europe, and throughout the world, and throughout the world, yeah. over the last since 1970 something, 1972. Okay. Yeah. And there's only nine pages blown up and printed, but you told me that it was the first nine of a hundred and something. Yeah. And I just wondered what, I mean, my first, my first reaction was, it, you know, I'm in an, a museum of modern art. <laughs> Why am I seeing this list? Is it, is it art? Um, and for people like me who like to create socially conscious um, products, let's say, artistic products, would like that to be art. Mm -hmm. um, but what does the art, how does the art establishment view that? Mm -hmm. And how did the organization view it? When you said, I'd like to put this list on the wall of the Museum of Modern Art, did they say, you're disgusting? <laughs> or did they say, that's fantastic? Yes, please. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> um, that list uh, was always in the back of my mind uh, for the exhibition. And I wasn't sure how or where or if it would have would be shown and at the time that the the exhibition was being developed um, that is an actual larger space and that wall is a construction wall so it's a temporary wall and it was a wall on which there was a sign once put that said um, the architecture and design galleries are going to now be uh, gone or under renovation and that turned into a furor uh, in the architecture media. But um, the idea of also placing something in a corridor of, of, of constant movement from one gallery to another, and also its adjacency to the staff elevator for the museum, uh, was quite telling for me. So to put something there that wasn't art, and it, it's not capital A art, you can touch the wall. And I've watched many, many people touch names and, and follow these trajectories in a way. In that space of movement, in that space of transit, to stop people and to read and to recognize and to realize that displacement and the millions of people that are, are in, on the move, literally, today, it's happening on every continent. This isn't just localized to the Mediterranean. This isn't just... Kenya and Somalia. It isn't just war zones. It's everywhere. And so those narratives that are part of the list, I felt gave a very telling preface to an exhibition or an ending, depending on where you're coming from, obviously, but uh, a very telling set of stories and narratives that are embedded, I think, in every work that is shown in the gallery space itself. And I also would argue that the list is likened to the empty life preservers that are on the wall parallel to it on the front of the gallery. 
Thank you. Um, hello. <clears throat> ben, may I? Yeah. Um, I'm Cynthia Griffin, who happens to be Sam Jury's uh, art dealer, speaking of art and these issues. But I was wondering, because you're talking about the situations here, and indeed they are all over the world, where people are really stuck in a kind of limbo in these places, and the lack of creative vision uh, geopolitically for dealing with it. Other than that, is there any place where you see any kind of impulse towards that um, where people can come together and begin to come up with ideas that may be different and more creative and change the situations in any way as difficult as that might be? Okay, should we take one other as well? There's a lady at the back up there, I think. Oh, sorry, I'm, I won't tell you how to do your job. <laughs> uh, hello. Um, my name is Georgia Elaine. I'm a visual artist. My work is uh, dedicating on the refugee crisis, focusing on uh, the European refugee crisis. I'm from Greece. I'm also coming from a refugee background. My grandfather was a refugee. And uh, I want to ask both your question, one as an architect and one, uh, you as a, a writer and a journalist, um, what's your advice for the artists that they want to ex uh, create images to uh, express this humanitarian crisis and engage more people to be uh, compassionate about what's happening? Okay. Um, I think the... I mean, the two questions are related in a way. I mean, on the the question of refugee agency, um, there are so few spaces for the refugees to meet other refugees from other experiences. The, the, uh, ironically, the, the place where um, most of the people that I've interviewed over the last 10 years um, have ha had the, the most cosmopolitan experience has been on the boats. Because you get to the Mediterranean and you're in these incredible um, difficult situations where you're relying on people who are also fleeing, who've also paid the smugglers' money, and you're and you're you're in these life or death scenarios where you know is it are you going to drink my urine or am I going to drink your urine, and or you're drinking each other's you know to get through though the, those days on the bows, um, but in terms of reflection and sort of creativity, that's definitely not happening on the front line of survival. The way in which I would s I see the sort of the the agency in in your in your question is actually in the ways in which daily life in the camp is um, being perpe is perpetuating beneath this skein of control. So people are painting their their tents, they're um, deciding to marry people that they shouldn't, or who their community decides that they shouldn't, or they're fostering businesses in the black market and making thousands of dollars and doing you know all sorts of different things with it so it's the creativity of that sort of daily life that it, that pulses within this framework um that's where i see the 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 sort of creative responses to um to the refugee scenario and to trying to do it differently um, there isn't a sort of abstract space where the refugees are being asked their opinions on un policy or anything. I mean, the only sort of um, the only sort of think tanks and conferences I've ever been invited to are full of technocrats who visit these camps but don't live there. Um, so, the still the whole discourse about how to manage the refugee crisis doesn't really involve refugees, um, and the the difficulty for you know people who are concerned. As humans, we see other humans suffering and we want to be involved and we want to help them. But back to the question of the text, we are limited to the tools of our own culture and the, our own ways of engaging. So, you know, I write a book about it, but nobody in the camp can read that book, or very, uh, that's not true. Many people can read it, but very few um, will read it or even will get their hands on it. Um, certainly, nobody in Somalia. Um, will be will be reading it. It's irrelevant to Somali politics. It's mildly relevant to Kenyan politics, but Kenyan politics doesn't sort of exist in a space that's unrelated to uh, reality. Yeah, rather like here. But the the you know so we're prisoners of our own cultural language. 
And if you're a visual artist, I mean, you've decided you're a visual artist, but the people that you then encounter may have, you know, a whole, there may be some other totally different energy coming from them which may spark something else. What, if in terms of, a, I mean, you ask for advice, I would ever, I don't really like to do that, but what I've, what I have said when I've, when I've spoken to, to student audiences before is that you go as a human being. And, and you engage with other people based on your talents and what you have to contribute. And then, and you see, and you go with, as, with a lot of curiosity and as, as little predetermined idea as possible. And, and those are really the principles. And then from there, hopefully some positive uh, activity is possible. Yeah. I mean, I, just to, to continue that, I would say that um, you know, I was writing about displacement and, and refugee questions from, uh, from a very scholarly perspective, a historical perspective mainly, um, when I was teaching. And I was in Australia, and uh, I had the chance, because I carry an American passport, to go to the most horrendous detention centers I have ever witnessed in my life uh, in Papua New Guinea, in Nauru, in Christmas Island. And I pretended to be a tourist. And that's how I got in, and then I started to work and document with people uh, who are stuck, literally stuck in these places. Um, and when I moved to the museum, I realized that these questions are, in effect, part of the story of modernism and of the modern, and, uh, and what has constituted modernity for years is this um, kind of reflection on, but perhaps ignorance of colonialism and, and the legacy of colonial edicts and invented territories, as it were. And so to make an exhibition about something that is happening now, that is happening and will continue to happen, for years and years to come is incredibly difficult and incredibly daunting for me. And so my objective, first and foremost, was not to aestheticize, meaning to freeze, but to engage the audience in whatever way possible, but to allow the audience, the viewer, to ask questions and not to give them prepackaged answers. The microphone, sorry, there's... Uh... I was just curious about the juxtaposition between being imprisoned in it and sort of stuck in these camps versus sort of how people are educating each other because you mentioned that there was a teacher and you mentioned that there was a woman who is schooled and educated about what it meant to be empowered in the human, um, the UN sort of lingo. and how that's being sort of taught to, to children and how kids within this structure are still kind of understanding a sense of dignity or a sense of being in something like this. Good evening, I'm a UN staff member. And I have to say that not only I like working for the UN, I love it. I'm proud of it. Yeah, you do a, a great and difficult job. <laughs> yes, we are many, and I'm one of the many thousands of works uh, in the refugee camps. I think under very hard circumstances, as you said, we do an amazing work with our limits, for sure. I also think it's uh, perhaps not very fair to say that the UN lacks strategy or vision, because as you rightly said, there are so many actors involved that it's very difficult, in particular for humanitarian actors and for the UN, who are in the end run by, I mean, the United Nations are made out of the states, right? To be blamed for what doesn't work. And said, said that, maybe just a point that I would have liked to see tonight, uh, something more about the gender dimension uh, related to all we've spoken about. Uh, 
we've spoken about uh, boundaries, uh, space, architecture. One of the things that, uh, and this is probably comes from my background, I'm a gender-based violence specialist, and of course I work in refugee camps. I think this is a dimension that uh, has been lacking as of today in the architectural planning, in the space planning, in the dimension, in the identification of the dimension and all what it means for refugees, mm. uh, being either a woman or a man, uh, being a child, a girl, or a boy. Mm. And perhaps I would have liked tonight also to hear a bit more about the gender dimension rather than speaking about people, because people exist as a collectivity, but people exist as women, men, boys, and girls. Mm. And I would have liked to see it as well also in the exhibit, which I appreciated very much. I think that uh, it's great to have something like that in New York, at MoMA, in a place where that really can educate thousands and thousands of people or something that not everybody is exposed to. Should we take, oh, we up yeah. side. Should we take one, the other one from this side and then? Uh, mine is really, thank you for that question. <laughs> But mine is almost a sequence to the question this lady asked about education. And again, we go back to the UN, it, it seems, or the UN or even the nation states that they consider, consider these uh, camps to be temporary. But then you're giving education, or the UN is giving education to children with a different vision of the world, at least in the, in the case that you mentioned of the young woman who now you know, she knows she doesn't have to marry whomever the parents want, and she has an, a different vision, but she's stuck in this space. So that seems to be a very big contradiction, either in the vision of the nation states or the vision of the UN. Yeah. So it, it's, yeah. it's, it's a question that actually touches on both of, yeah. uh, both of their questions. You know, I, I think there's there? a, I mean, I, I, I can say something that perhaps ties the three together, which is that you, you asked about the the education of of the young people within this within this structure with it, which is a, exactly a contradiction so you have uh, people who are stuck the um, UN is obliged to try and and look after people in the interim but also to equip them with skills for this life this purported life at the end of your refugee status which never arrives so you have some people in the camp who are a bit, little bit younger than me, 35, who were grown up in the camp who are still talking about their career in the future tense because they're hoping that they will have a life beyond the experience of the refugee camp where they will be able to put these skills into practice. But the Kenyan government doesn't allow people to work. So you're absolutely stuck. And the book is really an exploration of that psychological state, that limbo, um, where, in fact, there's a word for it in Dadaab. They've coined their own vocabulary, and the word is bufis. And it means this, where your feet are in the refugee camp, but your head is somewhere else. Uh, and you're, in, you're kind of stricken in this depression, and it lays people low for weeks on end. They can't get out of bed. They're completely stuck. They, they, I mean, many people commit suicide because they can't square that contradiction um, for themselves. Um, the, to, to just add perhaps about the, the gendered aspects of space there, uh, and the gendered aspects of education is that you have a whole generation of, of young girls growing up feeling quite empowered with the language of human rights, with the gender mainstreaming, with the, the, the examples that they're being given. And on the one hand, um, that's fantastic. On the other hand, there are there is what community leaders now in the camp have called an imbalance because the NGOs employ as interns and in the democratic process also privilege the female candidates and the female um, interns as well. So many of the men feel now that the, um, the informal employment opportunities within the camp, the opportunities to engage with the NGOs are very heavily skewed towards the women. So all of the, there's a big majority among the block leaders and among the camp leaders and the elected section leaders in the camp who are women. And, and then you have households where the men, who are often the ones who are traumatized from the war, don't have jobs, not earning any money, don't have traditional positions of leadership within the clan, don't have any of the opportunities to work or ex exercise leadership in the camp. 
and they're increasingly marginalized, they're kind of irrelevant. And that leads to, funnily enough, more domestic violence. Um, the, the issues of, of space and architecture are, an, uh, and the, the kind of gendered areas are definitely, um, the gendered way in which the, the, the grids are organized is definitely something that I've heard people talking in Dadaab about um, without any real uh, sense of, of solution. The Monday's story, though, if you get into it in the book, is all about the what's called the safe haven in Dadaab and the way in which that safe haven is constructed and compromised um, by the Kenyan police and also by, by the UN. But I think we, we can't get into too much of that because we're pushing up against our time. I would just, uh, I appreciate your, your, your view because uh, I would say from a curatorial perspective, it was incredibly important for me to acknowledge uh, women's voices in this, uh, in this issue, in this set of questions, because so often they are forgotten and they're not seen for various reasons. And so the majority of, of works that are on the wall are all produced by women. And in fact, uh, the works by Tiffany Chung, who her, she herself was a, a refugee who left uh, Vietnam during the war and was in a boat herself uh, in Hong Kong Harbor for a great uh, number of, of days uh, with her family. And so out of her work, what we see is an archiving of spaces and potentialities that for her is also a story of, of her life and a, of a reflection on escape uh, and on an escape of, from violence. And so it was, it was very important and critical uh, for me and the exhibition to have these women, but not to say this is an exhibition about women's voices but to acknowledge and to recognize the fact that there are women's voices that are indelibly marking these stories and these narratives of, of displacement. So with that, I, I would like to just thank Ben, of course, this evening. And uh, I know this is a relatively short conversation and hopefully in the future we can have more conversations like this. And I want to wish everyone, with Friday impending, that maybe we have to be a little uh, in Bufus uh, land <laughs> for a few years. Thanks for having me. me. Okay, and thanks. For Thank you. Me.